Gareth was uh, born in um, 1944, so I knew there was some similar <laughs> feeling that uh, he and I shared. <laughs> so we're both relatively young. <coughs> he attended uh, Melbourne High School. He holds first class honours in degrees in law from Melbourne University. A Bachelor of Arts at LB in honours. Uh, and in politics, philosophy, economics from Oxford University's Master of Arts. In those early days, uh, he was an academic lawyer, uh, specialising in constitutional and civil liberties law, and a barrister specialising in industrial law. He became a, a Queen's counsel in uh, 83. I dare say if I say something wrong, he'll blow up his hand. <laughs> um, he entered federal parliament <clears throat> along the way in 1978 as a senator for Victoria, and as a member of the Australian Parliament for 21 years, serving as Deputy Leader of the Government and the Senate, 87 to 93, and then as Leader of the Government in the Senate from 93 to 96. He moved to the House of Representatives in 96 uh, until September 99, serving as Deputy Leader of the Opposition, uh, that is from 96 to 98. And he was a cabinet minister in the Hawke and Keating Labor governments for 13 years. In the posts of Attorney General, Minister for Resources and Energy, and Minister for Transport, Communications, and finally as Foreign Minister, which was from 1988 until 1996, which is about eight years, which is, I guess, a fairly long time for a Foreign Minister to hold that position. And, and that is, I think, what we most remember the Gareth Evans, Evans for, because he was very prominent at that time, and I said remember as him as a, uh, a very clear speaker, he got his message across in the media, and that's the only way I knew of, of his um, achievements and what he was doing, uh, because he was a very good communicator, I felt. <coughs> so during that period of eight years, um, he achieved much on the international level, and I'll try and go through a few of them. Uh, he. Um, Implemented the UN peace plan for, Co for Cambodia. Uh, he uh, brought to conclusion the International Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, he founded the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group, which we all now know as APEC, which is a you know, it's a thing that just rolls off the tongue so easily nowadays. Uh, very prominent organisation. Uh, he was involved in the founding of ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, he initiated the Canberra Commission on the Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. And I think many of us would know from the media he had a long existence, a long presence with the IEA group, international group which uh, was concerned with uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. In May 2010, uh, Gareth uh, Evans was awarded the 2010 Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt Institute for Freedoms Award, uh, which for his pioneering work on the responsibility to protect, I think probably reflecting his. Uh, sincerity in, in uh, trying to protect the world from many of its evils, I guess say, and the uh, hardship of its peoples. <clears throat> in December 2011, the Foreign Policy magazine cited him as one of the top 100 global thinkers for 2011. And this is recent time, so uh, you know, that's a very uh, sensible, so very uh, spectacular achievement, uh, representing the man that we have here today, so recently. He was made an officer of the Order of Australia, AO, in 2001. <coughs> he has often doctors from several universities. He was a member of the Commission of Eminent Persons on the role of the IAEA uh, for 2020 and beyond. <coughs> He's been a professional fellow, uh, sorry, a professor, professorial fellow of the University of Melbourne since July 2009, which is the reason why we have to uh, Farewell in so promptly today because he has lecturing responsibilities this afternoon. Um, he um, has been Chancellor of the Australian National University since January 2010. <coughs> He's married to Professor Marion Evans, uh, an econometrician, who is Pro Vice Chancellor of Labor, Pro Vice Chancellor of Melbourne University. Sorry, Monash University. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we might claim her one day. <laughs> Um, they have two adult children and then four grandchildren, so we will relate to that. <coughs> Gareth's topic for today is making Australian foreign policy who matters. 
and I guess I'd be something along that thing, but I, I, I think he's probably wants to share a few gems with us and if you're able to 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 ask questions. So please give Gareth a very warm welcome. Uh, I'll save another day. 
Um, but you do tend to find uh, outrage developing on a massive scale around uh, issues which uh, you, know, you don't respond very sensibly and thoughtfully uh, to can really bite you on the tail. I think my worst experience in this respect was when the French exploded their last um, nuclear uh, weapon test uh, in the underwater Dura Atoll in Tahiti, which happened to be some 2,000 uh, or more, <coughs> it's more than 4,000 kilometers away. Uh, further, I calculated at the time, and the Russian um, or Soviet uh, facility in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan, and with you know, at least as little likelihood of ever affecting us physically, and given also the fact that it was um, the very last tense test that the French were proposing, uh, and the, uh, the impact on it was going to be so minimal, I had the stupidity of saying, well, it could have been worse. Uh, <laughs> as a result, uh, absolutely all hell descended, and uh, I remember the sort of the, the populist outrage that uh, Alexander, at least has had the decency, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, to see some guilt about it. He uh, <laughs> said when he came into office, he realized just what a catastrophic uh, series of diplomatic difficulties he created for himself by being as rude as it was to the French and everybody else about that. But, um, but these are the sort of issues that do capture the public imagination from time to time. And frankly, you just ignore them at your peril. And it's, if you had the kind of cloth ear that I showed on that occasion, you deserve, I suppose, to be whacked. But when you're looking at where the real source of influence are to determine the shape and character of foreign policy, you tend not to find it in public opinion at large in the same way that you do in other areas. The media, of course, which both reflects and helps create public opinion, likes to think that it's extremely influential when it comes to uh, foreign policy making. And occasionally, uh, some individual members of the media are. I mean, I think in particular people like Graham Dobell, uh, many of you will have listened to over many years on the ABC, the school blogs away, very thoughtful, always extremely well informed, always worth listening to. Uh, Paul Kelly of the Australian, before he moved to the full pontifical mode, completely uh -huh. might have a, a, a stick to go with it, um, was usually a uh, quite a thoughtful um, writer on these sorts of things. Uh, Greg Sheridan, who thinks he ought to be garbed in pontifical robes, uh, is, I think, one of the least reliable commentators that I've ever come across in any country in the world in terms of his uh, contribution to the public debate. Uh, I have the uh, great pleasure of describing him periodically as Mr. Toad of Australian foreign policy journalism, uh, consumed by his own ego, up, laughing away at uh, every passing issue and changing course in terms of his uh, characterization of who's uh, right and who's wrong. Uh, just about as rapidly as that uh, famous character in Wind of the Willows. But I don't want to be too rude about these people because uh, my future may depend on them uh, in some respects, as it has in the past. But um, I do think this disposition to describe yourself as Sheriff of Bars in his uh, writings occasionally as the most influential analyst in uh, Australian journalism uh, is a little bit over the top. Um, then you get to Parliament, Party Room, the sort of the closer to the inside. Here again, in the Westminster system that we, uh, that we occupy, uh, these are not very relevant institutions when it comes to uh, foreign policy. This is, which is overwhelmingly an executive preoccupation. You don't have many legislative opportunities to deal with the issues. And by and large, the, the debates uh, that actually move and shape uh, the course of action are very few and far between. That's true in the Parliament large, a little bit less true in some of the parliamentary committees that operate uh, traditionally in this area, which have produced good work, which regrettably has usually been given less attention than it deserves. The parliamentary party rooms can occasionally uh, reflect public sympathy on some of these populist emotional issues um, and be very contemptuous for the foreign minister, but by and large I think it's fair to say that um, foreign policy making um, tends to, to operate in narrower circles than that. Then finally you get to the, uh, the departments, the uh, second, finally, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, which obviously is a, a central player and always will be in the making and execution of foreign policy. 
Um, and increasingly, in the recent uh, years, the Prime Minister's Department, which has a significant uh, international relations component to it, and is always uh, capable and often willing uh, to make life difficult for uh, the specialists and professionals across the road in, uh, in foreign affairs. But really, at the end of the day, those departments um, have no more power or authority or influence than the people who lead them respectively. And finally, we do get to the inner part of the core, which is the, uh, the real people who matter when it comes to Australia's foreign policy making are the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister of the day. And the personalities here are just incredibly important, at least as important as any ideological issue. It's probably true of foreign policy generally, as you move around the world, there are far less uh, relevant ideological differences these days than there are um, differences in approach based on the different sort of cultural traditions or the personalities of the people occupying high places. But it's very, very true of uh, the conduct of foreign policy. Um, the iron rule that I think foreign ministers have to accept, so far as prime ministers are concerned, uh, but when the Prime Minister of the day has an obsession about something, you have to give in. Uh, full stop. Um, there is just no other way around it. The hope is that A, those obsessions will be very few and far between, and B, they'll be manageable in the sense of not being too hopelessly irrational or unachievable. And by and large, I had, uh, I had the huge good fortune of having a couple of Prime Ministers when I was Prime Minister in the war for the heating. Um, whose obsessions were relatively uh, narrowly focused and by and large were, uh, were a pleasure to deal with. Hawke famously was much more orderly, Keating by comparison famously was much more chaotic uh, in his uh, approach to this and many other issues. And chaos assumed a whole new meaning and subsequent prime ministerial incarnations, which we'll come to in a moment. Uh, but, um, and he did, and Hawk did have uh, one or two uh, obsessions. He had a particular belief in the virtues of the Commonwealth um, as a credible, meaningful institution, uh, which was an analysis not widely shared uh, elsewhere in the international community, although it did have a lot of resonance in the last days of apartheid, when in fact the Commonwealth did play probably its last great role as a mobiliser and shaper of uh, quite a, a significant. Uh, shaping of international public opinion on the question of financial sanctions, in which I was uh, closely involved. He also had one magnificent obsession, which I was very skeptical about, book, uh, when he started, on creating in the Antarctic a, uh, a, an exclusion zone for minerals and oil uh, exploration. Uh, I thought it was an admirable objective, but there's no way in the world we could make it fly. And internationally, the book had a very strong view that uh, we could and we should try, and he was absolutely right, and I was wrong, and uh, I think uh, the world's a better place as a result. Keating developed um, some magnificent obsessions of his own in relation to relationships with Asia, and with Indonesia in particular. Um, I thought uh, he was a little too over-exuberant in his attachment to President Suharto, in particular in Indonesia, uh, but as Gough Whitlam once Famously said, Paul has always had an attraction for older men. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, his Jack Lang enthusiasm days and so on, I don't suggest anything. He wanted more than that. But, um, but basically, Paul was right about the salience, the relevance, the credibility um, of our relationships with Indonesia and with the region as a whole. And I'll say a word to more about that before. I finished. And by and large, it was a pleasure uh, dealing with those two because basically they let me get on with the job. Basically, there was an atmosphere of mutual respect. Uh, and basically, we worked it in the way that this relation should work, which is basically what Asians call lips and teeth uh, relationship, whereby you're absolutely in the synchrony. Uh, you don't get caught in these situations where one of you, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister is saying something on the topic and catching the other one by surprise. This was uh, organised with Hawke in a much more orderly way, as usual, than it was with Paul, in the sense that Hawke and I would sit down every five or six weeks or so for an hour and a half or more and just work systematically through 
a contemporary imminently forthcoming agenda and just make absolutely sure we're on the same page. And the call was always much more erratic than that, but always with the same intent. I think the, um, the interesting thing about the role of the, the foreign minister in this environment is that you do get, most of the time, an extraordinary amount of leeway to develop um, either creatively or in other ways um, foreign policy of your own, simply because prime ministers are so overwhelmingly preoccupied uh, with so many other uh, domestic issues and so overwhelmingly preoccupied with the political management of the whole process and the representational stuff and everything else that goes with it. So foreign ministers can by and large you know, create space for themselves to get on with it. Whether they do or not, and how successfully they do, really depends on the kind of people they are, the kind of skills and qualities that they, they bring to it. And I think uh, there are probably three or four skills that are absolutely critically necessary and which really determine whether you can make any kind of a go of this job or whether you are going to be um, a bit of a, a big player and also ran in the wider scheme of things. Um, the first absolutely critical skill is just a capacity to get your head around the extraordinary diversity of issues uh, that constantly afflict you um, in this job. Um, it's very politically incorrect to say so these days, but it always reminded me of those old movies about Zulu coming over the hill, uh, actually wave upon wave, and uh, you know, the fierce defenders of colonial rights would be mowing down one way, and then another one would come out and say, issue after issue after issue, just demanding that you, uh, that you react to them. Uh, a bit like that famous remark of Harold Macmillan that uh, you probably heard, when, when said, uh, you know, what was, the, what was the greatest problem you had to confront uh, during your tenure as a British Prime Minister, and to which he replied, events, dear boy. Events. <laughs> um, so just responding, reacting to things not of your making. I was talking to David about poor old Hillary Clinton having to front up to Beijing today yeah. uh, to deal with this situation of the blind uh, dissident uh, hold up in the American Embassy, which is the sort of stuff of which foreign ministers and presidents and nightmares are made because you are caught so obviously between a rock and a hard place in, the, in dealing uh, with that sort of situation. But a lot of it just, it's not just the amount of the issues, but it's the complexity of the issues. And you can be caught out just incredibly quickly if your knowledge of um, you know, what these basic issues are about, which you can be questioned by almost anyone any time, um, if you just haven't got a grasp of it. And that requires an enormous amount of, of reading, an enormous amount of just capacity to absorb briefing stuff that's, uh, that's thrown at you, as well as the stuff that's out there in the, uh, the open source media and, uh, and elsewhere. The second uh, criterion or quality I think that, that really is necessary to make a go of this, or at least to make a go of it in an interesting way, is the capacity to think uh, a little bit out of the box, a little bit creatively, or at least a capacity to recognize opportunities um, as they arise. I don't know how many of us in this world who claim to be creative are really at the end of the day all that creative in the sense of germinating from absolutely scratch uh, things that nobody else has ever seen or thought of or or articulated. What matters most of the time when you're talking about creativity um, is just simply an ability to recognize something when it suddenly turns up in front of you and to, to take it from there. I think the classic example of this in my case was um, the Cambodian peace plan for um, the UN peace plan for Cambodia, which is one of the things which uh, people very nicely seem to remember about as one of the success stories of the government um, in that early period. And here, the basic idea, I won't give you the tedious detail of it, but the idea of having the UN involvement in a particular kind of way, which was designed to give basically the Chinese a face-saving way of withdrawing their support for the ugly, genocidal Khmer Rouge, and thus make possible a peace settlement which had eluded everybody for so long. The basic idea was not mine at all. It was one that was articulated in a conversation I had sitting in the, uh, the uh, Australian permanent rep to the UN's uh, living room in New York uh, back in 
1989, just having a desultory conversation with this US congressman, Steve Solars, who I was meeting more or less for the first time, and he said, look, um, he had this idea in his mind about how to solve the Cambodian problem, but he wasn't able to get anyone in Washington to listen. And, uh, you know, he wanted just to hear that I had some interest in these sorts of issues and uh, wanted to run a passport. So he outlined, articulated this. I thought it was a terrific idea and um, said so to him. And uh, things took off from there. But walking away uh, from that meeting, this is exactly the sort of thing I'm talking about, a very, very senior member of the Foreign Affairs Department who had been with me, just him and me, sitting on a couch listening to this guy, Said, and I said, well, what did you think of that? As we walked away back to the, uh, up to the, the UN. He said, Minister, I have to say that is the greatest load of poppycock that I have ever heard in my entire professional career. I said, well, you, you may be right, but I think it's worth some exploration. And uh, the way we went and we did explore it, and uh, the rest is sort of history. And I think, you know, it's just, you do hear stuff all the time. People are coming at you costing you lunches like this with ideas about various things. And it's really an ability to, to sort of pick those ideas which, which do have some capacity to, to, um, to move things along that um, is important. Now you can be a very, very competent and effective foreign minister doing all well, the basics, but if you want to get some of these breakthrough things moving, uh, this is particularly important. I think a third uh, critical uh, requirement is uh, the capacity to be able to empathize, frankly, with what other people are saying and thinking and the way in which uh, they see issues from their perspective. I mean, this is a fairly fundamental skill in just about every uh, walk of professional life that doesn't involve you in a test tube and no other form of human contact. But um, there is there's not many jobs like that around uh, these days. But um, I think it is capacity to, to sort of get at least some extent inside the, the head, particularly of um, you know, some of the most terrible interlocutors uh, that you might, in my case, dealing with, with people from the Khmer Rouge and so on from Cambodia, and just try to see things the way they saw and then see what the possibilities were of working around that. I think part of the, part of the capacity to empathise and put yourself in the shoes of the other person also relates to uh, other sort of skills which you might not at first sight think have much to do with that, but which are really equally important. And that's the capacity to, um, to uh, engage in some orderly process. Uh, because I think to engage in orderly process and to prioritize and to set demands on your staff or your department, uh, which are the kind of demands which are capable of met in practice and which will generate a reasonable degree of loyal support rather than hostility from the people you work with. It depends upon a certain capacity to put yourself in the shoes of the person who you're tasking and to anticipate what the nature of the task would be, what it would be like if you had to do it, whether it's doable within the time frame involved and what it's reasonable to expect. So I think that capacity is pretty important. And I think um, finally what's, what's crucially important, uh, maybe this is in some ways also a variation on the notion of empathy, and that's obviously a capacity to communicate, a capacity to persuade, a capacity to talk in <coughs> language that people who you're trying to uh, move to adopt some particular policy position will be prepared to listen to. So when you apply that sort of psychopathology to uh, and personality you know, criteria list to the recent occupants of this position, I mean, you come up with some pretty interesting conclusions. I won't, uh, I won't talk about myself in this role. I think it would be a bit tacky to talk about Alexander in this uh, role, though uh, I did uh, some very interesting conversations with him over the years, not, not least recently down at the Wheeler Centre, where we had a, a debate about um, the role of foreign ministers in uh, foreign policy uh, making, and uh, I told him publicly that I thought he wouldn't have actually been a halfway bad uh, foreign minister if he'd been his own man and not been so comprehensively subordinated to the will of the wills of John Howard, who had a different view of the world than his potentially and um, much more sophisticated one, but uh, that didn't get out terribly well. <laughs> 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 but I thought it was a compliment. 
<laughs> we might capacity to empathise. <laughs> but, um, but moving beyond that period to just a, to sort of the current period, um, and just looking, you know, where we where we got to with uh, with Kevin Rudd. I mean, as foreign minister, moving on now to he was prime minister. And I, th I think you know Kevin Rudd was a really pretty extraordinary uh, foreign minister. Um, in terms of you know, that first criteria I mentioned, the capacity to grasp issues, and also the second one, the, the creativity uh, to be brought to recognising opportunities uh, for not only pulling our weight at our weight, but above and beyond our weight, and playing ourselves into international forums like the G20, and playing a role out of all proportion to our inherent significance in the resolution of the financial crisis, in uh, creating all the might have some bumps along the way, some new architecture in the Asia Pacific region for both security and uh, economic cooperation. I think he was really, really outstanding. And I have to say that of all the people I've come across in my public life, um, I regard Kevin Rudd as almost unequivocally the brightest, the smartest, just in terms of raw, raw grunt, raw basic brain power. He is really quite incredible. But, and there's always a but, um, of course, I mean, the biggest but is the, uh, is the, uh, the empathy. Thing. I mean, this is a guy who is not a caricature to say it. He's all IQ, but practically no EQ. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a common sort of description, but and he can't help it. That's just the way he was born, I guess. But, um, but he really has to work hard um, to put himself in the shoes of others. When he does apply that formidable intelligence uh, to putting himself in the shoes of others and to working out in advance what he had to do in any particular audience at any particular time, he could be absolutely brilliant, as he was in a number of speeches I've heard him make, and of course his whole performance in a summarised program and so on, week in, week out, was capturing the mood. Uh, but it was all an intellectual uh, process rather than an instinctive one. And there in can lie a quite you know, fundamental problem if you're trying to do this job, as indeed uh, many others around the place. And the other thing, and maybe it is just associated with the same, uh, with the same characteristic, is the, uh, is the capacity to prioritise, to order and to shape and to move from um, you know, thinking up a good idea to actually ensuring its implementation and putting the necessary resources, including your own attention resources, in a systematic way to it, you know, to ensure its delivery. I had one personal experience of this, which um, is just a sort of a classic example, not of Kevin as foreign minister, but Kevin as, Kevin as prime minister at work. I mean, very early uh, January 2008, just after he was elected, I came back from uh, for Christmas from Brussels, where I'd been for the last 10 years running an international NGO, uh, to talk to him at his request over lunch about foreign policy issues and priorities and things that the government might do to make a bit of a mark. And I said in the course of a long conversation, well, one of the things you might have a look at doing is picking up the pieces where we left off back in 86 on this issue of nuclear uh, non-proliferation and disarm. Korea and Australia had initiated this Canberra Commission um, and had made a bit of a splash in terms of creating for the first time a sense that maybe a world without nuclear weapons was not a hopelessly utopian dream, uh, but a potential um, achievable reality. And why not pick up the pieces from there? Just a footnote in passing, I was involved in uh, creating that uh, Canberra Commission, not in seeing it through, because that was something the next government inherited and wasn't terribly interested in. But um, it was a fascinating exercise in putting together a high level international membership, which included people like Robert McNamara, the former US Defence Secretary, and the former head of the Strategic Air Command of the US, and Jacques Cousteau, and God knows how many other worthies of one kind or another. One worthy that I tried to uh, tried to tempt into the role was the recently retired British Prime Minister, recently unelected British Prime Minister Jim Callaghan. And so I got on the phone to Callaghan, who I met once or twice, didn't know him all that well, and said, I'd really like him to become a member of this commission. To which Callaghan replied, My dear fellow, I can't possibly join your commission. I'm a kloof, he said. Kloof. Kloof. It's a kloof. Everybody knows what Kloof is my decline. I'm a kloof, I can't possibly do it. Back was abroad, back was abroad. I said, look, you're just going to have to tell me. I don't know what a kloof is. Well, if you must know, if you must know, I'm sure you do. A kloof, of course, my dear boy, 
was a clapped out old fart. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have to say that's, that's contributed an important new concept to my vocabulary. <laughs> as I get older and I'm able to invoke the clue of defence to a number of requests for my engagement. Anyway, with that experience of the Canberra Commission behind me and behind Australia, I remember saying to uh, Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister, wouldn't it be a good idea possibly to create some commission like this? Or if that's not going to work, and maybe there's no more value added for that, maybe some specifically focused regional thing or some specifically focused thematic thing Area, why don't you? I said, I haven't got time to think about it. I'll go back to Brussels. <coughs> why don't you um, gather together some of the brains trust that does exist on these issues around Canberra? Three or four people have been sacked before their time by the previous government and they're hanging around all sorts of ideas but nothing much to do with them. I said, why don't you just gather them up and get them to advise you? Talk for a few days among themselves and advise you about what the options are and the possibility. Terrific idea, terrific idea. Let's do it instructed his secretary to write all that down and follow up accordingly. Next thing that happened was six months later, I get a phone call from Brussels saying, mate, uh, remember that conversation we had six months ago about establishing a new commission on nuclear non-proliferation disarmament? I said, well, um, I remember the conversation, but it wasn't to establish a new commission, it was to talk about the possibility of an initiative in this area. What happened to that um, suggestion I made for Brains Trust that you agreed with. It. So, oh, well, we didn't sort of quite get around to doing that, but um, I'd still like to go ahead uh, with the commission, and I'd like you to be involved in it. I said, a thousand other things on the plate. Uh, what's your concept of it? He said, well, I want to do it with the Japanese, um, because, uh, frankly, I've got a speech to make in Hiroshima next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this would be a very good announceable. <laughs> and I said, and all the people on the planet, I love the Japanese deal, but in terms of getting policy, creativity, grunt, decision making out of that system and out of key individuals there, there's a labour of Hercules. And then God saying, do we have to get out of Well, I've already discussed it with the Japanese <laughs> Prime Minister, and uh, he's agreed to co sponsor it, and he's identified a former Japanese foreign minister as a co chair of this. I saw what's coming, I said, you um, haven't really thought of me as the co-chair, but well, mate, I've not only thought of you for it, I've already uh, told the Japanese foreign minister this, and he's agreed, and um, frankly, we're all set to announce it. Uh, are you going to let me down? <laughs> well, that's sort of the way so much of that stuff was done, and uh, miraculous, I think we did make something of it. But the short point is that um, prioritisation is important, and um, you know, Kevin is going to bounce back into the limelight, it seems not totally impossible the way things are going at the moment. It really is something he's got to work on because at the moment he reminds me of nothing so much as that um, Stephen Laycock character, which you may be familiar with, who wants in a piece of writing and described the man who leapt upon his horse and galloped madly off in all directions. <laughs> Bob Carr, by comparison, is a very interesting um, current um, new foreign minister who I think um, does have a carefully honed set of sort of disciplines to go with his very considerable intellect. And also will be um, very, very effective, I think, in, in both his communication roles and in his, in his relationship roles with so many of the people that uh, this job entails. Dealing with. He's, he's also someone who's spent a lot of time thinking and reading uh, about the issues, which is an important uh, prerequisite. And um, you know, can bring the beer, but but he will uh, he will have some some difficulties. And he and I were talking a lot, and we're talking a lot in the first days after he took the job. And I remember one of those little conversations him saying, to people, "What's the single biggest pitfall I'm going to face taking on this job?" I said, well, I have to say, Bob, it's your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> because you will have, I know, exactly what I had and found at my cost of something I had to deal with. You will have the urge to say something interesting mm. whenever you're asked a question. Yeah. You will hate being boring. Mm. You will hate putting a dead bat in front of 
front of a microphone and just you know getting through it and answering a different question than one you're asked. You'll know how to do it because you're politicians too, but you'll hate doing it. You'll intellectually hate doing it. And boy, have you got to get over that because the secret of ministerial success generally, and the secret in particular of uh, foreign ministerial success, is to be a dead bore most of the time. Uh, well, I'm not sure that I totally succeeded in that. My own aspirations to do that as much as I tried and constantly got myself into trouble um, as a result. And uh, yeah, he's made one or two rookie mistakes which have been cheaply pounced upon by this uh, relentlessly superficial uh, press and uh, state of ours. But um, I think he's pretty good. So there it is. I mean, that's the sort of environment you're, you're dealing with. He's going to have to deal, and is already dealing, with a prime minister who, by comparison with uh, Hawke and uh, Keating um, is not very interested clearly in foreign affairs, although she has been acquiring uh, an interest pretty rapidly since those first dark days in Belgium. And remember, she told the world she wasn't in the size of interested. And I have to say, all the feedback I get, and I move around the world still a great deal, is that she's been uh, extraordinarily successful in um, articulating. Yeah, I will show. Uh, <laughs> extraordinarily successful in one-to-one -one, uh, content, in mastering the brief, uh, in personal communication, in personable uh, communication with others, and in conveying you know, the, uh, the issues. That's a very different thing from um, you know, having herself clearly sort of worked out view of Australia's place in the world. And one of my concerns is. Um, the one or two issues on which she does have very strong views, mainly Israel and Palestine, is an area where uh, they're not going to be used that are going to be extremely helpful for Australia in the, uh, in the period ahead, not least as we seek to navigate this uh, very difficult process of getting ourselves elected to the Security Council. Well, I spent far more time gossiping about um, people and, and processes than I have about talking about substantive issues, which is exactly the sort of thing we all say should not be happening. Australian politics at the moment, and we're far too consumed with, uh, with that kind of superficiality. If I was to open up some substantive issues, as I plan to before I realise we're running out of time, I would have um, said that you know, the big challenges for Australian foreign policy at the moment, I think, are fourfold. One, to ensure that we never have to play ourselves into a zero-sum game of choosing between the United States and China as our security and economic partners, respectively. Second thing, I think, is to recognize the reality that the Asia Pacific, which we traditionally sort of identified ourselves, is very rapidly becoming the Indo Pacific. And in regional terms, we just have to think through, get right our relationship with the new next big thing, which is India, and move beyond the cricket curry and the Commonwealth um, preoccupations that have um, limited that relationship so far. Thirdly, I would say that it's a critical challenge to get right and keep right in our relations with our immediate neighbours, the very biggest of them, Indonesia, and the very smallest of them, the Pacific Island States. And that's an issue and an area that's constantly fraught difficulty of one kind or another, but it's very important we get it right. And the final thing I'd say is the priority is to recognise the real qualities Australia can bring to bear to the wider global debate as a traditionally active, creative middle power uh, with a certain willingness and capacity to help solve global public goods problems like climate change and terrorism and God knows what else, and to be effective players accordingly in all those instruments, all those institutions from the UN down where uh, we can play an important role. If I have got time to develop any of those things, I can stick around for 10 15 minutes, I suppose. Kids will be shortchanged accordingly in my, uh, my lecture this afternoon. But uh, since I have occupied so much time opening up, I really should respond to some questions. So I'll give you now to do that. Over to you. Because I make myself unpopular, I know when I uh, become a timekeeper for a very popular speaker. And I'm just trying to respect our society to get away from the two years and the lack of there, I think. so. If you can keep your questions fairly succinct so that we get uh, time to respond. Uh, here first then. Oh, sorry, Philip. Oh. 
Thanks, Gary, for your uh, comments. I'll go to the, the, uh, the most macro question of all, I guess. Um, and just a quick uh, comment on how the, the role changed, how you think the role changed, and how complex it became in our market one day. I think we exaggerated the impact of 9-11. Um, and there was far too much neurosis about it. Obviously, we needed to get it right. The homeland security stuff, we needed to get it right. You know, international intelligence and security cooperation, and I think we did need to get right our immediate response to the challenge of uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan by going in and knocking them over, but going into an open-ended contest uh, with the lack of attention to detail about the strategy right from the beginning was involved in. It was a catastrophic error which we we're still bearing the, the pain of. Um, as with so many um, issues, you really just do have to try to keep them in perspective, and I think the whole so sort of preoccupation as Lamo fascism is being called and you know, the, the heightened neurosis about anything uh, to do with uh, you know, a threat or risk of any kind of coming from the Islamic rule um, is a grotesque overstatement of the nature of those threats given that you know, the, the fanatical brand of Islam is such a tiny, tiny proportion of even the activist brand of Islam. The activist brand of Islam which takes you know, democratic forms with the Muslim Brotherhood and missionary some other uh, forces, uh, is itself only a comparatively small proportion of the total community of adherence to the Islamic faith. So we, we just got a bit too over-consumed uh, by this, and um, I mean, I bore some of the, um, the impact of this uh, in some work I was doing at the time of 9-11 by just being chair of the big international commission on this issue of humanitarian intervention for all the world's response to mass atrocity. Rwanda, Srebrenica, Kosovo, the great issue of the 90s. And we produced this big report which came up with this concept of responsibility to protect, which has since been an increasing part of the international lexicon. And we can talk a lot about its relevance in Libya and Syria right now. But the debate about that was overwhelmed by the preoccupation that immediately uh, came with terrorism and the response to terrorism post 9 11. And it was quite difficult almost any other you know, foreign policy issues to get a look in. And some of the wrong sorts of lessons were, were learned um, from that. I think it generated not only uh, you know, the rush to Afghanistan, which was defensible, uh, but also it was a significant part of the, um, you know, the psychology that led to the utterly misguided invasion of Iraq in 2003. And it's still sort of hanging around as um, a very easy way of mobilizing the sentiment taking sometimes more robust action when circumstances can be required. That can be a self-fulfillingly destructive uh, policy. That's a big question, a long answer, but that's the nutshell. Maybe here was next then. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a Muslim from Australia, and I think you're Examples of people prepared to do crazy things to be 
in some way, some way it's done. But um, yeah, again, I just think we got to get on with our lives. And the Brits, on the whole, have been pretty civilized in their response to this sort of thing. They made that civilized by a relatively laid back response to continue. You know, that's the only way you can guarantee the continuation of civilization. We know not by getting pathologically frightened. I'd like to ask a question that's a little bit lighter than the others, and you might like that. Um, thank you for your talk. I found it most interesting. And I want to ask you something about um, if you know what's happened to Michelle Grattan. Uh, with your experience of political journalists, which I know has lasted many years, I think you might have an explanation why, from being a rather astute, fair and impartial writer about political events in Canberra, she's now become neither fair nor impartial. Now, in the AHS today, someone said it's a gender thing, and someone said, oh, she's getting old, so she's going to the right. But I don't think either of those is a suitable explanation. Do you have any ideas? Certainly getting old hasn't taken an old phrase to the right. Look, I don't want to sit down, Michelle. Michelle and I did mod government A together. Um, yep. McMahon um, all across the road, oh, yeah. 19, yes. whatever it was, and vied for the, for the prize and the subject. And I, I hope there's a huge amount of respect for the show. I think you know, it's not so much getting old and the brain cells atrophying and turning right, it's just getting tired and, and just doesn't have that same grunt that she had previously, that incredibly assiduous attention to chasing a story. Yeah. And she's, she's someone who you know, really should be dealing with policy issues and not getting consumed with yeah. the minutiae of day to day politics yeah. because that's not basically. Yeah, is that, but where she's felt under pressure by the current media milieu to go, so she writes this stuff, and by and large it's unpersuasive, yeah. and it's not very interesting anymore. No, and by and large, yeah. I think Michelle would have retired to be drinking magnums of red wine and looking at and living the rest of his life. But then I just yeah. heard about large swath of press going up as Michelle. Sure. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I come from a background of small health administration, oh, yeah. and my question is going to be a rhetorical one, yeah. uh, and that requires no answer. <laughs> Are you still an active member of the Labor Party? Uh, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lapse when I went overseas uh, because uh, they didn't chase me by Jews and I've got to pay and I haven't. I feel very confident guilty about that overseas. And I will do something about it prompted by your rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the, rest, the rest of my entire family now votes green and I, I've got to do something to uh, recover some ground. Anyway. Can I have a quick comment on our um, relationship with the current political situation in Burma? Well, I'm optimistic about the future of Burma, and it's been a very interesting journey, that one, because I was of the anti-apartheid generation when the language of constructive engagement with ugly regimes was the sort of language that made us all you know, wash, our, want to wash our mouths out and we're really busy of uttering it. But for the last eight or nine years, uh, when I was at the National Crisis Group in Brussels running this NGO, we pushed the door open in that direction. We said sanctions are taking us absolutely nowhere. Uh, this is an incredibly inward-looking, isolated regime. It's not taking any notice of what the world thinks about it. Economically, it's untroubled by getting enough support anyway from China and India and the Navy. Uh, we need to rethink, and maybe the way to do it is to look at the shoulder level of the next uh, generation of military guys coming through and explore the possibility of just opening that discourse up to keep open the possibility of uh, something moving, and even with the constitutional changes of a couple of years ago, which most people dismissed as purely cosmetic and irrelevant and not really change at all, I was one of those saying, one of those saying, I think we really need to explore this, and I'm delighted that things have come as far as they have, as quickly as they have. The trouble is, it is very fragile because um, nobody quite knows whether the current president of Myanmar. I think we should get used to calling it Myanmar, by the way. It's not a, it's not an issue. Not an issue for the Burmese you know, themselves. They, they, they're quite comfortable because that is the, the ethnic name. And Burma's the name bit in the middle. Myanmar's the whole country. But you know, it's become sort of a 
a politically correct thing. If you're on the side of light, you call it urban, and the side of darkness, you call it the animal. You, know, you just have to move through these things. But, 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 but um, it's very fragile because we don't know whether this guy um, you know, really has a strong body of support within the uh, military or whether he's just flying almost solo. And um, it's very important, I think, as a result, that the rest of the world be responsive to what's happened to give him some feathers to fly with from his more skeptical colleagues for having opened the doors to this extent. Um, you know, he's, he's going to see some progress. So it's, it's, it's a delicate way forward. Um, there's still a lot of stuff happening around the border, um, tribal areas and so on, but I don't think we should use that as an excuse, as a lot of policymakers now are, having been confounded by the extent to which things have opened up the door. So Suu Kyi have said, ah, but there's still be able to both those who are capturing on others around the tribal areas, so don't let's... Well, that wasn't the preoccupation before, don't let the preoccupation now. Let's explore and see what's mm -hmm. actually vertical. So I think Australia, now the present government, has been prepared to go on that particular level. Have the last right. First place. Thank you. Please, may I ask you uh, this question? In some sense, why aren't you secretary of the United Nations? <laughs> 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 I mean, well, there's, there's everything bad well, about you. There's everything good about you. There's several answers to that in terms of uh, in terms of qualifications. I mean, uh, one is uh, I've never been from the right area. The right time really since you and there's no way the Asians were going to regard Australia as a potential uh, you know, member of the Asian bloc for the purpose of that voting constituency. But I think uh, a more relevant, uh, immediate answer is that uh, I was always associated with a little bit more colour and movement, and that job uh, was regarded as appropriate in the uh, I think uh, P5 thought I'd be uh, very much harder to handle uh, than uh, some of the other characters. Oh, well, you meant to get out, did you? Mm -hmm. you meant to get out. <laughs> You've got to be asked and chased to do these things. Nobody was asking, nobody was chasing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, point yeah, campaigning no. in that environment. So yeah. I didn't ever, despite the, the number of things that you know, people like you, Bruce, keep on reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. I've had a couple of other hands up, but yes. it's not that's fine. Yes. Yes. Just, um, yeah, George, Mark, sorry, Mark, sorry. Mark, you're an expert. Have you ever had the aspiration or the opportunity to become a Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, every person in politics has a you know, general's knapsack in their band somewhere. And, um, but I basically abandoned that aspiration uh, from day one when I was in the Senate. Um, I had the choice of hanging around and waiting for a lower house seat to open up, but um, I knew that could depend on all sorts of uh, uncertainties. Uh, the Senate thing there was always there for the taking of 78. Then. Once you go into that sort of stream, you really rub yourself out. I did make the late shift uh, in the last three years of my political life. Uh, and I was in pretty much in Kloof territory, I think, at that stage. <laughs> uh, and uh, it wasn't really, uh, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't an option uh, at that stage. But, but really, I, I feel, you know, I feel pretty comfortable uh, with the kind of career that I have. It's had some pretty spectacular downs as well, ups along the way. but. Um, it's been hugely interesting, and I and basically I found that as a policy person rather than a, a politics person, and that's what I am. I mean, I found the Senate a more congenial environment simply because you had to argue your case. You couldn't just bellow and shout and use the numbers. You had to persuade the minorities. You had to deal. You had to negotiate. You had to craft. You had to draft. So that was that, and um, and also just the, the the ministerial jobs I was able to do, the foreign ministerial job, and so on, uh, would have been much trickier. To House of Reps base and would have been more consumed with the politics and less with the policy. I frankly have enjoyed uh, the role that I played and I can have no sense of regret at all for not being around. There's an awful lot of downsides come with the big down, really, really big down, and we can see them. Um, historical question, really. Um, I've been reading about really the League of Nations and how people did not survive. Um, what hope do you have for the United Nations? I think, I'm, I'm an optimist about the United Nations, I'm also a realist, um, and you always got to remember um, uh, Doug Hammarskjöld's famous remark that the United Nations is not there to lead us to heaven, but to prevent us from sliding to hell. And that's really what it's about. You've got to remember also, 
um, that the United Nations is the product of its member states. Um, every now and again, a charismatic uh, Secretary General like Kofi Annan can emerge and, and to some extent do some agenda setting on his own. But basically, basically, you are the president of the dynamics of work between the states. And don't blame uh, you know, the UN for the real politic of international discourse, as um, Dick Holbrook once said, the former American senior diplomat, uh, to blame you know, the United Nations, a bit like blaming Madison Square Garden when the Knicks lose. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just mistaking the context for the dynamic. And the United Nations does a huge amount of, apart from the peace and security things, where it sometimes gets it right, sometimes gets it wrong. It does a huge amount of things in the you know, peacekeeping and that part of the policy area, plus the health and the welfare, um, right across the, uh, the spectrum of issues that UN agencies um, deal with. And um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a great supporter of the UN, and I do think it's incredibly important that Australia keep that particular flag flying. Mm -hmm. As a middle-sized country, never going to be a great one, able to get our way by force of arms or economic clout, we depend upon a rule-based international order. Mm. The UN Security Council is the pinnacle of that rule-based international order. We ignore it at our peril. The UN is much better positioned, I think, than the, uh, the League of Nations ever was, given its charter, given its membership, and given the, the strength that the notional strength of the Security Council has, which the, the League didn't have, mm. uh, to, to play that role. So uh, you've been reading really what Frank Morehouse said. No, I'm really sure calm, yeah. I'm, I'm really calm and for a little. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But for those who haven't, if you haven't read uh, Frank Warhouse's mm -hmm. trilogy um, um, of Grand, Grand Days, Dark Palace, and uh, mm -hmm. the latest one, mm -hmm. um, just absolutely superb implications of that uh, information period. But uh, that's another story for another day. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. In my introduction, um, my recollection of uh, Gareth's communication skills, and really they were based upon those sort of uh, three minute or was it three second sound bites that you see on the evening news. Uh, whereas today we've had um, the great pleasure of being able to listen to Gareth uh, chat on in a very cosy fashion for all of us about some of his recollections of the past and his relationship with the Prime Minister, Sandy Lee. Uh, the way in which foreign policy is coordinated between the Prime Minister and the President and the Prime Minister. It's, um, it's been quite an insight, and I think you've shared a few gems, gems with us, or then you wouldn't read them from the Shell Grafton, I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we can tick off the communication aspect. The other item I did not mention in uh, my introduction, which um, I had intended to do, was that which we saw earlier on, and that is his sense of magic because not, a, not very many speakers can pull off that exercise with a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, we've, we've certainly been very privileged today to have Gareth with us, and, um, and, and we thank him very much for his running over his time. We, we are sure there are some students somewhere who'll be missing out on the spin of our game. So, um, with that, Gareth, I appreciate that nowadays you do not get very many opportunities to sign you know, important contracts or treaties in the world. But uh, should you ever get a, another chance to do so, we would be very pleased if you could use <laughs> the Graduate House pen. <laughs> and, uh, also, um, I dare say, you've been to many very prominent um, dinners and functions and receptions for very important people. And, and you've probably had content such as what's contained in here in your glass at the time. Yeah. So. Um, in fact, we hope that will also bring much uh, out of some enjoyment to your friends. Mm -hmm. okay.